paint. I probably am getting over the razor edge now. But what I want to do is seal everything with one coat of clear. That's going to be the next step here is get one coat of clear on everything. And that will at least let me to work on if I'm going to do some ink or some retro sets or whatever. But here's the bottom line. Is from this mixture, I can add all the thinner I want. I can divide it up however I want. I can do any. But I don't want to use any more, if I possibly can, than two quarts of light coat or half a gallon. So from this can, I will thin it with each progressive coat a little more thinner. But the first coat, especially around the canopy, I don't want to get anything. If you put on a lot of thinner up around that canopy, you'll melt the damn canopy for sure. So let's hope we're going to get the clear on, and that'll be the, except for more thinner, that'll be all the clear we're going to need for the whole plane. Now, obviously, this is the clear gun. I want to clean this out as much as possible, too. Now, one of the best things to do, and I've already set it up, is all the little parts, flaps, elevators, hatch, doors, radiators, tip weight box. Always use that for an experiment first, since we're doing from a new can of paint, new can of material. We want to make sure that, that we don't have too much thinner or not enough, or that the temperature is too cold, too humid, that it's going to fog over. Any number of things, but always a test on all the little parts first. Always a good investment. And really, if I get one coat of clear on everything, tomorrow I can start laying out some ink, some letter sets, some lettering, some, uh, I gotta put the AMA number, I gotta put the squadron codes, nose art, whatever. But I have a feeling if I don't put this one coat of clear on, by the time I'm done, all the little finger, because my hands are really getting ratty from this paint, by the time I'm done, this there'll be fingerprints all over the plane. This is like an investment in uh, keeping it clean. Okay, you can see just about what the texture is. This is a little bit on the thick side. But I'm going to try to leave it on the thick side and just jack up the pressure a little bit because I want this coat to go on dry. This is kind of a sealer coat. I don't want to have this go on too wet. Just a little on the orange peeling and dry side. Just about how that should be for the first coat. And candle that and see just about just about how much orange peel there is in that first coat. Relatively thick. Now one of the small advantage I thought, I didn't think of this in the beginning, but this would probably be true. One of the things that'll happen is when you see ink lines and letter sets disappear and you'll still have one coat of clear over the paint, so uh, maybe this will work out better than I thought. Anyway, it's going on real nice. Now to radiate is what I did. I put some tape in here, but it was still too flimsy, so I ran a couple of pins in. This is an old piece of scrap. Another good test piece. Just orange peely and dry enough, I would say. That's just about what I'm looking for. Get that coat on, but I don't want to melt anything. I got this up on an Allen wrench. I can't touch it, but from candling it out in the sun, it really does look about right. So I'm going to get ready to paint the mainframe. Get that first coat on there. Now I got all the small parts. I'm relatively satisfied with the way the clear was going on here. But always, always do these parts first. Now what I also did out there, I'll show this on the tape, I took one of the extra canopies and sprayed the hell out of it to make sure that that paint wasn't so thin it was going to melt the canopy. I want to be very conservative with it. Now I'm just looking at this, I didn't even let this dry it, but I sprayed the hell out of this to make sure it wasn't going to melt the canopy. Because I have taken canopies and melted them, and if you get that first coat on there too wet, uh, I assume that's going to be okay. I'm going to pull a tape off for of this guy, and we'll be ready. Now remember, each time we move that tape back just a little bit, now you get the final uh, impact is that, oh God, that word impact. You just have that final little paint bridge and a couple of coats of clear should take care of that. No, I don't know how 
about Joe's canopy is coming out, but this one is, as far as I can tell, this is really going to be nice when it's finished. And those edges, there's almost no edge there at all. There's a one cone of paint edge. That's a real nice radius in there. We're all going to be able to just wipe this right down. It'll be no problem. Famous last words. <laughs> Every time I say something like this, there's some kind of nightmare coming up. Anyway, the next step, let's get it hung up out in the laundry room and get some from that mix, that gallon. Let's get a coat on here. Okay, what I did, I tried to, as I've done this before, I've tried to get paper towels under here so I can get as much around the perimeter as I can. The reason is I want this horizontal. It'll take very little uh, chance there'll be a run in. And then I'll take it up out in the room and hang it vertically and then spray the rest. But I would like to get that first coat on just like this. I tried, I went outside for a few minutes and the last half an hour it's dropped about 15 degrees.
you know, even now I see a spot I missed here, so. And a tour is nice and smoky. This is one right there. That's what's nice about those ketchup chairs. Oh, well, this is drying up. One of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to take the old gallon of light coat, add a little more thinner to it. And each time I put a coat on now, from this point on, it'll be a little thinner than the coat before. All 3608S thinner. The humidity was good. I didn't need to add any retarder at all. A couple little touch-up spots here. Right while it's wet, I've gone and touched them up. And that's what's great about having that touch-up kit with all the brushes in it. You don't think that pays? You're spraying and you see a little, because you always see a spot. You, yeah, I didn't see that before. Oop, you touch it up. Shut the clear on, blends right in. It disappears. It's amazing. It just goes away. When that's sanded out with 1,200 and buff, you'll never see any of that. I'll let this cook off here for a while. Now, at the end of a session, and this is so easy and, and it's unbelievable, I take all these, these little brushes, no matter what color they are, chuck them right in the can of thinner. I was amazed, by the way, this canopy didn't take any of any hit at all from the dope. Now, some of these, especially some of the sick canopies that are real thin, oh, man, high risk. Anyway, tomorrow we're going to come back here. We obviously can't do much on it tonight. We're going to come back, start doing our detail work, inking, riveting. Well, I don't know what we're going to do yet. I'm going to be looking at some books tonight. But this touch-up kit now, I'll just put the lids on the jaws, and tomorrow we'll be all set. We're right back in the mode. This is one of the handiest little things because in the next couple of weeks, couple of days, who knows uh, how this thing's going to go. You're always going to find little spots right up into the time, even the time when you buff through paint. And because it's dope, because it's lacquer, you always can touch it up. And having this kit around just makes your life easy as can be. before I pack it in here, I'm just looking around. This dried up beautifully. One of the keys here, I don't know if this is going to be, uh, you know, something you can use or not, but one of the keys certainly is that the heat has been up in the house. And that heat, that vent is cooking away. And keeping it hot just seems like that's the way this dope likes to dry. So with that, I'll see you in the morning. Now I figure <clears throat> this dried up beautifully, and I don't, you, I don't think you can really see or, or appreciate just how nice this paint all dried up. I, I attribute most of that to the fact that paint went on on a very unhumid day, even though it was cool, but being by the heating vent really seems to help. Anyway, one of the tips, I'm going to pass this on right now before I forget it. This is one of those things, I constantly do this. I take. Let me put this up on the camera. I have the elevators off the plane, and I want to... Now, what I'm going to try to do is assemble a whole plane so that I can look at how I want to lay Letra sets out. I need to put an AMA number. I need to put squadron numbers. I need to do other things. But I like to do it with the plane in one piece. One of the things you can... And I've done this, and you get yourself in trouble, and you could kick yourself in the ass. I always wind up, when I go to put these on, take a razor blade, even though it's a small amount, in this case it's only one coat of clear, get the paint off the horn. Keep the horn immaculately clean. What happens is, this is like a Chinese necklace. This seems to go on, but boy, try to get it off. So before I even put it on with a hinge there, I try, oh, see, that won't go on even now. There's still some more on there. The first time you do this, and it makes a Chinese necklace, that paint gem, and then you try to wiggle it off and it won't come off, oh man. So what I'm suggesting is that I'm going to do it for sure from this point in the plane on, because I don't want any dings at all from this point on. If you even take a piece of sandpaper, wrap it around a horn, clean that up between coats of clear if you're going to reassemble a plane. But make sure when you do go to do an assembly, let's get a hinge here. When you do go to put the plane back that you can get, and from this point on, this is going to come apart and go together a hundred times. 
I want to lay out some ink work, I want to lay out some letter sets. Okay, but you want to be able to do this, is take it right off. If it's Chinese necklace and on you, you're going to be cursing. And in some cases, you can do it so badly that it'll either damage the fillet or damage the hinge pocket or whatever. Good tip. Now, I may have to uh, make a confession here. <laughs> I'm not trying to say I have an unbiased opinion. I'm really, I guess, what amounts to be a Spitfire or a World War II warplane bigot. But I really do think this is coming out real, capturing the look that I wanted. And that was one of the things I was really uncertain of if I'd be able to do it. I'm showing at the clear, the edges. You don't want to sand now where the edges will just come out rough. I want to get maybe eight, ten coats of clear on in, and I'll carefully sand that. But boy, that is just, that is just perfect. That's, <laughs> I don't know. I really like that. Anyway, it's the look that I'm after. And this is something that's hard to, hard to explain to people what you're looking for as a look. A certain look. I don't know, but in, in my own bigoted, prejudiced way, this really has captured the Spitfire look. Now, I'm at the point in this where touch-up is still an ongoing thing. And what I did, I did this yesterday. Laid out all the, the touch-up jars. Touch-up is an ongoing thing. You're always going to have little spots where you notice. And I just saw one here, right up, right here, right up against the fuse, where there's kind of a ding. We did all that repair work on the nose yesterday. You never, until you put the final clear on, you're never through touching up. Even putting on that final clear, there's times that you'll want to, oh gee, there's a little light. You'll notice things you didn't know. The first time you look at a plane real close, you notice things, you, things you don't notice. I don't know what happens. You get fussier and fussier and fussier. But the point is, I leave this touch-up kit out. I'm going to, I take all my ink pens out. I went out yesterday. In fact, here's the damn bill. Look at this. Thirteen sixty-five each for letter set sheets. I bought a black one and a white one, the small one. This plane will not be all covered up with, uh, you know, ironing board stunt kind of lettering. I got white ink, which I'm going to try, but I have very little hope that that's going to work. And of course, the traditional black ink. By the way, the black ink is for. Let's do this. For film. Film is the ink that you want. You don't want the other stuff. Anyway, we got plenty of pens, and usually by this time of year, they're all dried out, and half of them don't work. All my ink line stuff, I'm getting ready to sort through this, pick out the fresh stuff. A couple tips. You can see from the price that, that these electric sets just get more and more expensive every year. The Tom Lay ones are still the staple of, uh, of what I use, most of them, the nice little sayings and no steps and everything. But the point is, you got to... And I'm going to spend probably an hour or so here, or some amount of time, deciding how many ink lines do I want to put on this, how many letter sets, how fancy do I want to do it, and how I want to do that squadron lettering. I, I haven't settled on that in my mind, but the point is, you don't. As the plane is evolving, it's coming to life here. I don't want to cheat it in some way. I want to do a little bit of nose art if possible. But there's so many things you would think right now it's a day or two away from being done. Baloney, it's a, it's a long time away from being done. Because I really want to put that little extra effort in that makes it a special plane. I really am committed to making this a special plane. Now in yesterday's mail, just one of the things that came in the mail, this is from Ed Gallagher and he sent a bunch of stuff and he got me in touch with, I haven't called the guy yet, he sent me just, just an unbelievable amount of all different kind of resins and release agents and everything because I want to mold up those exhaust stacks or be able to mold more cowlings for the people that actually want to build Spitfires. By the way, just for anybody's uh, information, built up Cardinal kits are supposed to be coming in no later than this week. And of course, uh, that, that's subject to uh, the bullshit factor, I call it. But I hope no later than March 1st to have some Cardinal kits to build up ones. The foam ones are on back order still, and I'm shipping them out as fast as I can get them. Believe me, I have no control over that end of the hobby. But with that said, and with the fiberglass, see now, here's the deal too, is I have that in stock. I can think about that for a couple of days. I can give that some thought. Same thing here. This is a very critical part of the job, is I want to always be looking at the overview of the plane. Is it getting too busy? 
I don't want to turn it into a plane, and my golden rule for retro sets is always, if you don't know how many to put on, one less is better than one too many. You know, in years gone by, and I probably have pictures of these planes around here, I did this plane called the Vision. And man, it had 80 million boxes, and we used architect things. It had bushes growing on the front, toilet bowls, and oh man, you can get carried away, and it really looks cheap and tasteless in my book. I, I did it, that's how I know, and I didn't like it. So I want to be real conservative. I have those books, and I never get them too far out of my sight. And they do show the line drawings. One of these books has some real good line drawings in it of where the ink lines should be and things like that. I just never get tired of looking at this stuff, believe me. But there's a point to all this. And the point is I've seen an awful lot of people get to this point in the job and look at the calendar and say, ah, oh, ah, oh, the Nats is only three months away or something. And they rush through in a couple of days, what should take a couple of weeks, and really don't do the plane justice. And if you're talking about a plane, in this one I have a tremendous, I probably have 300, 350 hours in this already. So many out, to, to compromise it and, and take a shortcut is just, I don't know, just, just not what I want to do. But So with that said, let me get the thinking cap on and get ready to do some work. And here's one of the things that, uh, come on over here, you puppy. One of the things that I always think is uh, significant anyway, you put a whole lot of work into a canopy. I've done this so many times, like you, you want to choke yourself at the end of a time. And I've gotten to the, the executioner, for instance. You get to the last coat of clear, and you just keep putting it on, putting it on, putting it to it, and, and it melts the canopy. Well, what I did yesterday, I took this and just blew on. I got runs going down the side of the canopy to make sure I'm not getting the paint too thin that it's going to melt the canopy. And what I'll do from this point on is every time I spray the plane and add a little more thinner, I want to look and see, have I gotten to the point that I'm melting the canopy? I really want... Now, 3608S is real good. It's a low-penetrating thinner. But if you're using SIG thinner, Randolph thinner, or some thinner that, that dries slower and may penetrate, you might want to do this test more often. Another reason to have more than one canopy when you do a canopy it seems like a lot of this stuff is self-evident, but I've seen so many people make a nice canopy, put the pile in, put, put that clear on there, and all of a sudden, mm, the canopy melts. So this is a good test for you to have. It's good, too, at this point in time. And as I'm taking this plane apart, putting it together, taking it apart, putting it together, one of the things I always check for is how do all these lines line up? Does everything line up? Because a lot of times, you cheat yourself. You don't put a plane together till the very end. And, oh, that, gee, if I just would have just straighten that ink line out or something. So, it seems like a lot of this is overkill, but you know what? It's, it's not overkill when a plane comes out and you're happy with it. It's, it's death when you get to the end of a plane and do something and say, oh, if I only, if I only didn't put that last spoonful of thinner in the clear, if I only put, didn't put that one extra incline on, it looks like a road map now where it looks like uh, something that you're not happy with. The ink and electro set and the detailing part of this a very time consuming. It's not hard work. It, it's boring, if anything. But I want to do it in a way that's tasteful. I don't want to just do one of these things where there's a line here, a line here, a line here, and there's letters, and I, oh, we got it. Just looks terrible. This is this is a, I guess, like a Mercedes Benz. It's very soft and and very. Uh, it's like the Windstar actually. And I don't want to clutter it all up with a bunch of nonsense. I really want to keep it looking as scale as possible. See, in fact, what I do, I leave that canopy right in with the touch-up paint. Then I don't forget, as I'm going along mixing, 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 I don't forget to put that in. I don't forget to give it a little test. Because as you make the clear thinner and thinner and thinner, it's the thinner that's going to attack the canopy. It's not the paint. It's the thinner. Now, you can just get some idea of how many different types of lettering. Look, this T is up higher than the A. Different styles of lettering. You really have, this is the American version with the, the chopped off pieces. Red lettering, white lettering. I'm going to make the lettering yellow, even though that doesn't look too prototypical here. In fact, nobody's got yellow lettering, but too bad. I want to uh, have one of the letters go over the, uh, the white, so white isn't going to make it. That's with the invasion stripes, that's not going to work. 
now I'm trying to evaluate this area here to see, uh, here's the criteria. I want to have one letter in each stripe. It's obviously not going to be a perfect match. This letter is going to hang over. But I want it to be on center with this in parallel and all three letters the same and yellow. So what I did, I did this off camera. I looked through my letter set box, traced out one of these. These are big letter sets and I just traced it out in yellow to get an idea of how that would look. And that's kind of the look I want. It's a real simple style. It doesn't have the, uh, you know, fancy, fancy dancy look. It, it looks like what a warbird should look like. Then what I did, I selected some letters and I wanted the Y. You can see why I picked the Y because the Y, if I had a, if I had the Z over there, for instance, it would hit the flap fillet. So I don't know that when I lay this out on the other side, I'm going to make both patterns up first and make sure that uh, this is all going to fit before I trace it out. Now no notice one other thing I did here. I picked squadron markings that have no round letters so that everything is a straight line. That was one of the criteria, was all straight lines. I made this a match to the pattern. And what I have to do is figure out pretty much where the round L is going to be here. Round L starts here. I can lay out the same letters on center. This will be the center. Center the tail. Center that. So with all those center lines in mind, now I have to lay out, and the letters are different. The space is on the other side of the round L. I want to get a center line on here. That, that center goes for the round L's and the letters too. Now I know the round L's are going to go. This is kind of a crude way to make a pattern, but it'll be effective and it'll work. And I'm going to use the rubber cement method. We've probably done that on video before, but if you haven't seen it. Now, I need to lay out the F. Make sure I have enough clearance for the flap. To fill it on the flap, this is going to be a tight fit, boy. And I want to lay out, it's F, what the hell is it? F, Z, Y. Z is going to go here. Oh, Z is going to go back here. So I'm just laying out centers and corners. Roundel over here, we're on the other side, it's FZ and NY. Now since I already have these letter sets, the easiest way to do this is to just actually use the letter set. Nice when you can just press as hard as you want, which in the real world, with, when these are made for going over cardboard or something. And then I'll trim these with a brand new, brand new number 11 blade. And at the same time, uh, try to keep the edges straight and true with a ruler. So now one of the reasons we have to make a compromise on this lettering, on a real Spitfire, if you were making a scale body, the wing would be lower, and we could carry this into a more, uh, you know, scale location, I guess is the right word. We have to make a compromise. Yeah, these letters could be a little bit bigger if the body, if the wing was lower, we could carry them over. Now I'm not sure about it, I'm sure somebody out there will know that we're not cheating somewhere on a squadron, that the squadron, these two letters should always be on that side of the round L. If it is, hey, don't hang me because there's just a lot of compromises here because of the shape of the body and where the wing is. So we're going to cheat the system and I'm sure some, somebody that's even more uh, scale oriented than I am is going to pick up on that there might be a mistake here or a tentative mistake that uh, that Z should be on the other side of the round L, but then it wouldn't fit. It would run into where the, f the flap fillet is, and a real Spitfire, of course, doesn't have a flap fillet anywhere near where that one is. Just one of the compromises we're forced to make here, but that's part of the, uh, at least to me, part of the challenge here. We're not really making a scale model, and we're allowed to cheat. We're allowed to have fantasy squadrons and fantasy I Karen just walked down before she was doing some laundry and she looked at FZY and she says, what are you naming it, Fuzzy? <laughs> I guess it is right. I guess it is. Could be. It could be construed as Fuzzy. Anyway, I'm going over.
these boxes, by the way, that I ship things in, these are really handy for doing this kind of work. And I'll strip this out using uh, I'll Bob Martin's official ruler, machinist ruler. Again, you might want to, and I considered putting, you know, my initials in here. I know Al Rabe used to put R on the letter. Or you could put, uh, you know, your girlfriend's name or whatever. But this is a real squadron that really existed. And they really, uh, you know, I don't want to take a chance that WDU was like the, uh, the squadron that couldn't shoot straight or something. Who knows? I'm sure we'll learn more as time goes by. And if anybody out there knows how these squadron markings were arrived at. It's my understanding that they started with the word, with the letter A and then worked their way through the alphabet. So who knows, you know? It's the kind of thing a scale modeler would have to really check up, but we can fantasize. Well, what I'll do is I'll pass some of these extra letters on to Joe in the thought that maybe uh, he'll want to use the same or, or something similar and he can send them back to me when he's done. These are the, uh, the squadron marking templates and we got all kind of letters. See, if you pick the letter, an O or a U or something, there's a problem. How do you put an incline around that without making a template? And I really, uh, you know, I don't want to make this any more complicated than I have to. It's complicated enough. Believe me, this, this paint job that looks so easy, and it's a shame that it looks easy, because <laughs> where do you go to do it? <laughs> now, a couple of things we can do to make this job easier. Of course, we can take the flap off and assume it's going to come right off. Yes. Now, I've just taken some 600 paper. I'm just dusting this. I don't want to sand through. The minute the sandpaper changes color, you're done. This is why I had a coat of clear on here. And this just lets the... Uh, the rubber cement sit down a little flatter, especially where the letters are going to be. And I know there's going to be a little edge up here we have to work around, where these paints all the edges join. No big sanding to get it flat, just enough to get a, uh, a nice flat lay down on that paper. Now, this is just some M600 to clean this up. Now, a, a good tip here, rubber cement doesn't last, you know, 10 hours. When you do a rubber cement job, what I'll do off camera, I'll go mix up the yellow paint, put it in the gun that has the lightest color, clean the gun and get it on, get the gun tested and ready. Because what the trick is, is I want to get the rubber cement on, get the, the piece in place, put some foil around it, shoot it, let it dry, and then go around and do the other side. I don't want to put the rubber cement on and then spend 45 minutes, an hour bullshit, do something else. I want that cement to sit down as nice as possible. So you got to kind of work through this. I would say you probably could leave it on for an hour, but it, you certainly don't want to leave it and at the end of the day come back. It, it won't be as good as if you do it quickly. Let me give you another uh, real good tip. I set this up. So the whole ass end of the plane hangs off and then some blankets are holding it in place while I'm going to do the work, the spray and masking. If you didn't have this coat of clear on here and you start sanding the color, what I've seen happen is some of this black will fade into the white, the pink turns white, and you make yourself a mess you can't believe. What happens, as soon as you hit it with thinner, you've got a problem. Now, that's one thing I didn't even think of yesterday when we were putting the clear on. I didn't think this was going to be some uh, hidden advantage, but there certainly is a little advantage to having that. And of course a little bit of M600, clean up the dust, and we'll be ready to lay out the patterns. Now once you think you're ready, yeah, this one looks dried out, let me get another one. I don't know what the life expectancy of this stuff is, but this, this looks thicker than it really ought to be, but let's see if we can get it on here in one, one fell swoop. Again, the nice part about this is you can just put it on, you can move it around, peel it up, where if you did this with A1 contact paper or frisket or something, you might be pulling paint up. If this pulls the paint up, you're already in suicidal mode anyway. 
and just don't have to be fancy about this at all. I would suggest something though I just learned here in the last two minutes. Maybe every year you should buy a new jar of this stuff. This stuff really does look kind of dried out. But we'll find out. If it bleeds through, it really isn't the end of the world. We're going to do an incline around the lettering anyway. Lay this crap on there. Now I'm looking up. Can you believe President Nixon has the boss to call here? You get this in position. The trick is you blow up all the gummy gummy bears and the rubber cement that's on the letters. In fact, this rubber cement, even this can, is all dried out. I'm going to send Craig to the store for another can. This looks kind of slimy. And you get all that rubber cement off of there. If you have a big, always start toward the corners. Get it all out of the corners. It just wipes right off. Not a big deal. Make sure the corners are down. I'm going to put some foil around here and this will be ready to do one side. Just give this all just a little press down if I can. Obviously going over the black takes ten times the amount of paint. Over the white it really shows up well. This is shit. This is all coming apart. Hey, just one more thing you can learn. Don't use old rubber cement. Well, you really should let this dry longer, but I want to get moving on this. Of course, it's a good idea to let the paint dry. We got a little overspray here. I can clean it off with a Q-tip. But I'll give that about a half an hour to dry while I'm working on the other side. And what I want to do is clean that whole thing up. That rubber cement will come right off. Let me just see. I'm not going to peel this off yet. I want to let that dry up. But while this side is drying and while I'm waiting for Craig to get me some more cement. By the way, I like the way that that kind of does look okay. One of the things I want to do, I got this book that Ed Gallagher sent in, and I'm looking through all kinds of nose art. This is German nose art, of course, but there's there's just hundreds of choices because I'm going to invent my nose, my own nose art, of course, a, kind of a little shield or something. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. And just look, these these are obviously German planes, but it was a very popular thing in World War II to have nose art, custom custom nose art, and I'm looking around. Just for ideas of, of what I, uh, you know, what I think maybe I can use to spruce up the spit while I'm doing this kind of templating, it would make sense to do the nose art and do this lettering since they're both going to be roughly the same color, both at the same time. And just some more examples of. Uh, Kind of like something like this. I gotta look. I gotta think of something like that. I always like having a shield on the front of my plane, even a normal stunt ship. Hey, that's kind of nice too. Plenty of ideas. This book is loaded with nose art. There must be a thousand. To, even the B-17 nose art. <coughs> and because it's not a scale model, we can kind of can invent our own. 
funny, even the bombers had no resort. Some kind of unusual nose art here with the hand coming up. Look at it, even the Corsairs. Even the Corsairs had some kind of nose. It's a very popular kind. I'm looking at squadron markings too and see that the Americans are totally different. Now this is this is American airplanes, but of course they showed a different rudder trim. Really, aren't the checkerboards? Stripes, big checkers. Triangles. So if you're doing an American, uh, you know, carrier based plane, boy, it looks like you have a lot of choices here. This is the ultimate in nose art. I know that's a, that's of a scale. Uh, 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 that's a real picture too. It's not something, you know, somebody painted on. Hey, by the way, I just heard from had a call uh, uh, ten minutes ago from Randy Smith. Randy Smith is building a Spitfire. Kind of cool, and uh, looking forward to seeing Randy Spitfire. Looking forward to seeing Kaz's. Looking forward to seeing Bob Bartens make progress on his, and of course Joe's is already in silver. So look at this and this nose art. This has got me captivated here. What great books we've gotten in this project too. It's just hard to believe how many people have been willing to share all the stuff we've gotten. from Memphis Bell even. Hey, very popular nose art. By the way, just so you know, even if you're not into really doing all this hand painting and this artwork and stuff, you can buy, I know several people sell nose art, uh, like press-ons or whatever the hell you want to call them, but, but there's just so many. It, it's just unbelievable. I could go on here all day. I'm going to start laying my own out right now. I'm inspired. I'm ready. Ready to go have a slice of pizza. Well, like it or not, we're at the end of the table. We don't have much. Uh, I hate for this to run out right in the middle or something. So, a couple of minutes more here. I'll shoot a few, a few of these extra pictures. Maybe just give you some inspiration. We'll pick this up on the next tape with nose art. More nose art. Them and pass them around. See you on the next tape.